Hi there, Lindsay here, the frugal crafter and painter too. And today we are going to paint some cyclamen flowers. Now I just adore these little plants. And I saw this at a local discount store for $1.50 and I couldn't resist. Um, and whenever I have a real life plant, like a flowering plant that comes from a grocery store or some other place that I can't resist but probably won't be able to keep it alive very long, I like to paint it. Now I've painted this type of flower before many times. So when, that, when I happen to paint something that I've painted a lot of times, before, I try to think of something new to do with it or a new way to approach the subject so I keep it fresh and interesting. And I had another limitation. I'm working on this block of cotton watercolor paper. The paper is gorgeous. It is the Hannah Mule Cezanne paper. Um, it's wonderful. The only thing is I'm getting down to the last couple sheets and I'm finding it very difficult to remove the paper from the block. And I have um, had situations where I've actually torn some of the edges. So I want to make sure that I don't paint really close to the edge. So what I did was I just took a pencil and a ruler and I just drew a square very lightly so you probably can't see it. Um, so then I thought it would be really fun to sketch with something different so I'm going to use waterproof uh, black ink and a dip pen and um, I like the speedball ink. This ink is not for fountain pens though. It's cheaper than the waterproof fountain pen ink that I that I get for my fountain pens. Um, so if you're looking for some waterproof ink on a budget and you're not going to put it in a fountain pen you're going to use it with a dip pen. This is a really nice option um, and I'm just using a very very inexpensive dip pen. Anything you have is fine. You could even dip a, um, like a, probably even dip a toothpick for that matter. Um, what I want is some kind of interesting lines and I know just using a dip pen is going to give me that. Um, I'm going to go right in with the pen. If you want to draw first with pencil and outline, that is totally fine. But what I want to do is kind of exaggerate I get one really kind of big leaf, at least one big flower, maybe three flowers, um, and just really kind of go in depth with just a couple aspects of this so I can have fun with some of the media. So I'm just dipping my pen in the ink. Try not to get it on the handle because then you'll get it on your fingers and that will be very messy. And I'm going to draw one leaf. And let me just actually move the plant in a little closer so you can see that too. Hopefully you have enough light on it. You won't be seeing it exactly at the same angle I am, but um, I always think it's nice if you have something in real life that you can draw from. So I'm going to start by putting in this big leaf. I'm actually looking at this one here. And I am going to give it a nice serrated edge. I don't know how long I'll be able to go without having to reload. This is really great if you've had like five cups of coffee, you'll have those shakes naturally and then you can uh, you can really make the most of it. Now I wanted to extend this off of the box. I'll just bring it around so I meet up with that edge. And I'm not going to worry about any uh, like drops or splats or anything like that because um, that's kind of what I'm going for. It's kind of why I want to use the ink. So I'm going to leave that, that, uh, that thick edge there. And actually I think I'd like to thicken it up here a little bit more. And um, I'm not going to put the veinings in here with this because I think I'm going to do that with a white colored pencil. A um, viewer gave me a tip on using it like erasing over if you've done the uh, colored pencil erases to erase on top of it after the paint's dry. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's a fantastic idea. I've got to try that because sometimes it doesn't resist as much as you like. I'm going to do a smaller leaf over here, kind of tipping out to the edge. In fact, another way you can do this, if you have a hard time kind of figuring out where you're trying to get to, is to kind of play a little game of connect the dots. So you kind of like kind of just dot around where you want your line to end up so that when, when you're going with a pen, if you haven't drawn it beforehand, you can kind of have little guideposts to go to. And those dots, especially with a serrated edge leaf like that, will just disappear into your line. And maybe I want to have some of the box showing and I want some things going over the box. Um, I think I'll get a couple, get a flower or two in there and then decide how I want to proceed. I want a nice big one up here. Get the bottom of the, of the uh, flower, probably this one here. They're like kind of a circle underneath and then the petals go back. And so I'm going to do a nice big petal going up over the top. I think I need to load up with more. I am not, I don't use a dip pen too often. I think it's nice to kind of grab those materials that you have collected, maybe not use that much, and put them to use because um, it's going to kind of, you're going to be able to travel back to that point where things were new 
and it will um, kind of foster that sense of creativity and it also just is, you know, it makes you feel good to use something that you've been holding on to but you haven't gotten a chance to use yet. So, uh, so I'm all for that. Anytime you feel like you're in a rut, give that a try. It usually helps quite a bit. Now these plants have, let's look how many petals, one, two, three, four, five, so I can sneak two more petals in there. And if I see like a better angle on one, I will uh, use whatever one is going to be the best for, you know, for what I'm trying to achieve here. Or I will look at a different petal if I think that I want it at a different angle, just so I have some nice variety. There's so many beautiful blossoms on this plant that I've got a lot to look from and choose from. Alright, now I want to give a stem to that. And the stems will come out of the back and you usually can't see them until they're coming down under the flower. So I'm going to go ahead and just... I'm just going to start to sketch one because I'm not sure where I'm, what other flowers I'm going to put in here. And I'm actually going to look underneath there and you can see there's just like a little bit of um, like a stamen coming through. I also grabbed some gold ink because I wanted to do some gold. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to put it, but I've seen some watercolors with gold accents that I think are really pretty and I'd like to do that. And look, what I told you not to do is get ink on the handle and I've done that, so I'm going to wipe off the handle. I think I just tipped my pen back and it dripped. But I kind of like how this, I mean, this is just going to be messy I, and I know that and I'm totally... I'm totally okay with it. In fact, I'm encouraging it. Um, so now I think I'll do a bud. So the buds just kind of look like triangles. I got one right there. It's very small. And I think I'll just kind of sketch that here. There's a little kind of husk around the hip, the hip of the bud. And I'm going to bring it down like that. Woo, got a big glob of ink there. And then I'm going to bring the, the petals are just kind of folded up in there. And then that stem can go back. Like I said, if you don't want to do this with this pen, you don't have to. And then I think I want one more flower, maybe a smaller one. Like this little guy right here that's just opened up right here. I like that. It's very, it's a different color too. It's more white because it hasn't, I don't know, maybe hasn't grown that much. And we can't see on the inside of it, so it gives us a different dimension. Goodness gracious, I am kind of struggling with this pen though. It is a cheapie. I don't know if that's why, or I think it's user error, quite frankly. <laughs> I don't think I can blame the pen. There we go. Got five leaves on there. It is a little bit wider than it probably should be, but I think it'll be fine. Okay, so now I am going to bring these, these stems down. It is neat to draw with something you are not used to because you are just, you're going to have some weird edges. You're going to have some, um, kind of some problems here and there. You're going to have some things that are not, uh, that are, you know, unpredictable. And I think that's kind of part of the fun. Just get that little dip in there. There. I think this will be fun. And you can always add other things like collage in there too if you find you have some areas that aren't working for you. And that is, I think that's part of the fun. All right, so that ink is going to take a little bit of time to dry. I feel like I want to do maybe a little bit. Um, just try not to lay your hand. Oh my gosh, that's all right. I'm just going to put a few more specks since I've got that one there. Um, I wanted to make these lines a little bit more substantial. Okay, and I think that's pretty good. And that gives us a little bit of an interesting base to go from. Oh, something else I want to do. I'm going to see if I can do this without using my ruler. I want to um, get these this box sketched in a little bit better. I 
I think I need to turn my paper as I do this. I'm not really great at straight lines. Try to keep that up there so you can see it. And I think how you hold the pen really determines how it's going to want to flow for you. But this is not a proper pen use video. This is not the, these are probably not the nibs I would grab if I was going to do something really serious. I have speedball nibs that I would trust a little bit more just because, um, uh, just because they're kind of more of a, a name brand. This was just a novelty set that I picked up at Jerry's uh, a few years ago. I liked them because all the nibs looked like, they looked like fingers and they had like just weird, um, weird little designs on them. I thought they were cute. I totally missed the line on that, but that's all right. But I didn't want to spend a ton of time on it because I was still kind of afraid I might rip it, bringing it off the block. So it kind of gives you the freedom when you're not worried about wasting the supply. It gives you the freedom to really experiment and have fun with it. There. And I just thought that was kind of a fun idea. And I think I'm probably going to end up putting the gold in the background, the gold ink in the background there. Um, I don't know if I'll paint around the splots. I might add some more splots later. But, um, but that's what I'm going to do for now. I will clean off my brush, I mean my pen properly when I'm all done. Okay, and I'm going to cap this off right now so I don't spill it. And the next thing I'm going to do is um, I want to put the uh, the pattern on the leaves there with the with a white colored pencil. And I'm going to start by making kind of a long vein. Oh, it's funny, this white colored pencil. It looks kind of cool next to the tone of the paper. It looks almost like the it make it look, this looks a little bit blue and the paper looks a little bit yellow, um, just because of the warmth of the watercolor paper. Generally has like a um, kind of a natural white color. All right, sorry about the phone call interruption. Um, I'm just gonna go in and draw the little veins that I see here. And I'm also going to put in any of those kind of light splotches that I see. So if you see that, I'm going to bring this up a little bit closer for you. All of these leaves have this kind of like pattern in between the veins, just kind of like a splotchy light colored area. I want to get that pattern on there. I'm going to use the, uh, the nice thing about this, is like with the color temperature being a little different, is that I can see where the, where I'm putting my pencil marks down. So that does help a little bit. I realize you can't see, but I, I'm just kind of going over the techniques and then I'll um, I'll edit out all of that extra stuff because you probably won't, won't need to see that. But um, I think maybe if I hold this to the light in a second after I get these, these patterns in there, you'll see what I mean. It's enough that when you're doing this at home, you're gonna be able to see it, but it's not so much that it shows up really well on the camera. So let me just show you this area here. I think maybe, oh, can I catch the light? I think you might be able to see it a little bit in there. And if you want kind of a broken area, like some of that has a broken area, go on the edge of your, of your pencil and just kind of scumble, which is where you kind of scribble around with the edge and it's going to catch the, the texture on the, um, on the paper and give you that really easily. So I'm gonna finish up that on these two petals and then we'll come back. Also, if you have any pencil, like where the, um, where your, your box, your pencil, if you drew a box like I did and you can see some pencil through that, before you put the wax down, I recommend erasing that so that you don't end up getting, um, getting, locking that underneath the wax. And I actually got a brand new eraser I wanna try out that is, um, Super, super skinny, and I'm, I'm interested as to how this will work on my watercolor paper. I haven't even opened it yet. There's some ASMR for you. The crinkly noises. Let's give that a try. It's the um, top of Mono. It's very small, and I thought this might be work really well because, see how tiny that is? That tip of that eraser? Because that way you don't have to worry about getting into the wet ink. Oh, that works really well. It's It seems to be pretty much like your white eraser. You know, just make sure you have enough advance that you're not going to scrape the metal part, the little metal casing. Um, so you don't scrape that against the paper, because if you do, then you're going to, when you do your washes over with watercolor, you're going to end up with these um, this marring on your surface. It's going to take your paint more, and then you're going to end up with dark lines. So just make sure you're not jamming the metal, kind of ferrule part of that eraser into your paper. But, oh, that works great. 
And I want to make sure, you know what, before I blow the dust crumbs away, I'm just going to make sure that's complete, that my ink is dry. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to finish drawing in the veins and the splotches on these two leaves, and I'm going to let all this dry, and when we come back, we're going to do our watercoloring together. Okay, the first technique I'm going to show you, I've let this dry, by the way, is the open drip technique, and we're going to have to skip around a little bit as we do this, so I'm going to start by wetting this petal. Um, I did use my heat tool to help dry this just to make sure it was set, um, which isn't a bad idea to like use a hair dryer or something just to make sure that you've really got it dry because if the paper is damp at all, if the ink is damp, it could still run on you. So you want to make sure that's all set. So you wet the you wet the petal and then you want to find a color that you want to add into it. And I'm going to go with this magenta here. I'm going to clean off the palette because it looks a little looks a little dirty there. I think I might have mixed up my colors a little bit. There we go. And I'm going to add this right here to the bottom and I'm going to just kind of let it wick up. You could tip your paper. But I want to kind of get that little bit of a capillary look to it. You can drip in other colors too, like if I want to have um, a little more purple in the bottom, I could take some of this magenta color, I can add some, let's do a little bit of like a phthalo blue to that, so I get a really transparent color, and let's add that kind of in here to the bottom and let it drip up. And if you wanted to add like another pure pigment color, I've got kind of a, um, like a mauve here. I think it's actually called Bordeaux. It's kind of a whiny, uh, purpley color. Or it's even, it's very much like the mauve from Windsor Newton. I can add a little bit of that in there too. I can even take that and add that with some of the phthalo blue and add that into the shadowy areas. So don't worry if like if you have some crazy lines like I do. I mean by the time we're done it's going to be good. Let me move that up closer just so you can see that kind of change of color that we have. And of course you could lift some out if you wanted to. Um, I think it's fine the way it is. Some of your petals are going to be lighter, some are going to be darker. I think you're going to end up with some nice variety anyway so I wouldn't even really bother with that. Um, so then let's go to this one. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to wet it with clear water. So since I'm using really strong pigments, it's really important anyway, but I always wa rinse my brush off in my dirty water and then I get fresh water in my clean water container. So it's a good idea to have two water containers whenever you're working. And I might be over explaining here, but this is my Wednesday video, so I try to keep it a little bit more uh, beginner friendly so that everybody feels, you know, like they can paint along. And, you know, the nice thing about having, the, having a block of watercolor paper or taping your watercolor paper down to something is that you can, um, you can tip it and it can help it all flow and move. It grab some of this pretty... Bordeaux color. Let them drip and blend. If you want to like kind of help things along, you can go in with a damp brush and just kind of like maybe you didn't wet as much as you thought you would. And you can go in and help it spread a little bit. But the key is to let a lot of it do itself. Now if you want to highlight, just go in with a damp brush and lift away. Now that area there, that was dry paper, that's why I have a really white spot there, that's why it's perfectly white. Um, I think I'm going to leave it, I think that's kind of neat, but you could just take a damp brush and touch that area and then the color would float in there, so that's up to you whether you want to do that or not. I'm going to go with a little bit of the phthalo blue with that Bordeaux and just kind of drop it in there and let it do its thing. Those color, those petals would be dark because they're in behind this one. This one will be a little bit lighter, uh, but I can't paint this until those two are dry. I can paint that little guy back there, though, because he's not touching any of the wet petals. So I'll go in and wet that. Now it's smaller, so I don't need as much water. And it's going to be fairly light because it's way up there, so I'm just going to use the magenta on its own, I think. And depending on the paper and the paint you're using, you might need more or less water. I'm going to let it do its thing. I think it's going to fill in the area just fine. And over here, we've got um, these little channels of 
petals. So these are all petals that are all kind of wrapped around together. So I'll actually wet two. And then I will drip in a little Bordeaux up here. And a little bit of magenta right next to it. And then I'll just do whatever's left on my brush there. Let those dry and then I can do the other two. Um, but when you do the open drip technique, when you have these petals next to each other, the thing that's really neat is that you'll end up with some harder edges where the pigments get pushed to the edge so it'll help um, separate all of those different segments. So try that sometime you're painting a flower that's got a lot of different petals together. Do one petal at a time, wet it, drip in your color, let it dry, then you know do the next one. And then you'll end up, you have these almost like a stained glass look, it's really pretty. Um, and then for this one here, uh, we'll do the same technique, I guess. And this one's lighter. I'll start with the magenta, and I probably won't use too much of the other colors, just a little bit. Ooh, that's probably a little stronger than I need. If you need to soften it, just rinse your brush, wipe it off, and you can go in and lift some out. And I'm just going to put a little bit of that Bordeaux at the bottom. And I probably shouldn't have done this one first because now I can't get to any of the other ones because that petal is touching all of them. And that's alright because we have these leaves we can move on to. And I'll start with this one over here. Um, I'm going to wet it. Now sometimes it's kind of neat if you don't give your paint uh, your, your ink enough time to dry, you'll actually sometimes touch into some pockets of uh, not yet set ink and you'll get a neat effect. Um, so that's just something you might, you know, you might want to try. It just gives you a very immediate look that I think is pretty. Uh, but, you know, it's if you're not expecting it, it could be a little traumatizing. This color is really pretty. It's kind of like um, like a Russian green or a hunter green. A little bit deeper than hooker's green but I love the texture of this color. I'm gonna also add some of the cinnabar green which is almost like um almost like a cross between a sap green and a spring green. Actually well that color is pretty oh my well I didn't intend to do that but I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm going right over the um the colors the, the the colored pencil. I'm debating now. I'm like, should I try to lift that off? I might be able to lift that off. It's so pretty. It's such a pretty color. I must hate to. Uh, and do I want any other colors? And then maybe I'll take a little of that phthalo blue and add a little bit here and there just to give it a little bit more interest. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what I can do here in the lifting department. Since I'm, let's work on this one over here because that one's pretty far away. First, I'll just lift off what I can, and I can always spatter in there. I've already got the ink spatter, so I'm not worried about that too much. I'm going to use a um, clean brush here that's golden tackle on, so it's a little bit stiffer than what I what I typically use to watercolor with, and we'll see what we can do. It's still going to stain a bit. The yellow in that green seems to be a little more staining. So I think that I'll probably end up just either painting in a background out here or spattering something because that is not exactly what I wanted to happen. Actually, might as well, yeah, since I know that I'm going to have a stain there on the paper anyway, I think that I will go with it. I'm just going to kind of wet the area here. And I'm going to add some color. I mean, I might as well, right? You, When you made a mistake, you might as well go with it. Uh, so let's grab some of these colors that we just used and have some fun with it. We can go ahead and splatter some on even. Splatter it right into that wet area. I think that if you, you know, if you make mistakes, that's totally fine. Sometimes it opens up the, your eyes to a whole new technique. 
I don't know why I chose to wear it like a fairly nice sweater today. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, I've been wearing that green, dingy old green sweatshirt. So you like, you see green sleeves in like every single video. I mean, you see these blue dingy sleeves in every video. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wear something nicer today. It's like, I just tempted fate is what I did. Cause it's like, yeah, I'm gonna have ink all over myself and everything before I'm done. I like that though. Look at that. I kind of like that. So I'm not upset with that. Other people might be horrified, but I think that's kind of cool. So... I'm going with it. That works. It works for me. I'm almost thinking I want a little bit more of that darker green there as the colors kind of merge out. And I'll really be bummed out though if I rip my paper as it's <laughs> when I'm removing it from the block now because I am doing something in the border, which isn't what I intended to do. I'm actually gonna put that up at a little bit of an angle so I can uh, so I can let that drip and flow a little bit. Now, if I leave these beads of color here, it will back run, but I think that would be kind of cool to have that texture of those kind of cauliflowers in there. I love the texture that I'm getting in the in those leaves. Okay, so I'm going to now wet this leaf and do the same thing, except hopefully not spill all of my. Uh, all of my paint in the background over here, but who can say what will happen? It's just a painting adventure with odd materials. Oh shoot, you know what? I forgot to erase that little line there, but you know what? This green is so dark, I don't think it's gonna matter. I don't think it's gonna show. And that's what I meant about having a pocket of ink that's not quite dry. Uh, that's what we got going on right there. I should have heated that longer or waited longer. Probably this is too, yep, yeah, but that's all right. I don't mind it. I am going with the flow. This is for me, it's not for anybody else. That's a wonderful thing about experimenting. Now you wouldn't want to experiment on a painting that somebody has paid you to make probably, you know, you probably would, would be a little nervous to do that. But here, where it's your painting, where you're the only one you have to please, why not? And I think that if I make a mistake, I could edit it out, you know? So I don't even have to be afraid. If, I, if it really bothers me that much, I can edit it out. But let me tell you what, I think that it's more valuable to leave a mistake in so that you can see how I fix it. I think, anyway, let's see. I've, have I used this color yet on the sleeve? I like to use every color and just kind of let them let them flow in. I want to make sure I keep that serrated edge there, so I'm just kind of wiggling my brush along the side. Now I have to decide, do I want the texture of back runs in my leaves? I'm not sure. By the way, the paint that I'm using, you can use whatever watercolor paint you have. This happens to be the Renaissance Polish watercolors. In case you're wondering, Oh, I like that. I just, I really love the texture. I can kind of see the veins that I did with the colored pencils there. I, I'm really curious to try the erasing technique over the dry paint. Um, I was really excited about that when um, when one of my viewers suggested it. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try that. I'm actually gonna flick some water in here and see if I can get some of that paint to actually drip out into the background because I really liked the way that looked. So what, I'm, what I've done is I've just splashed on some big splotches and now I'm going to very gently make myself a little pathway so that can hopefully flow. Oh isn't that satisfying? I just love that. <laughs> I think that is fun. I don't know why. I just, oh I love it. I, well I love the open drip technique anyway because your paints just flow and you get this vibrancy and this immediacy that I think is really unique to watercolor. Uh, it's one of the things I loved most about it. Something that would be kind of fun to try, let's wet our stems and let's tip our paper and let's see if we can get some of that to flow up our stems. That would be kind of cool. All right, I got a bead of water on my brush. I'm just gonna dab that over there on that rag. And so I'm gonna touch the, um, I'm just gonna wet the stems and then I'm gonna gently nudge it into the wet paint and see what happens. I don't know if there's enough there for it to flow, but we'll see. So I think um, what, what drew me to watercolor was that seeing artists work where it looked like the painting just happened. It's like you couldn't really put your finger on where, you know, the humans were involved. The, the painting just seemed to spring forth from the, uh, from the paint and that is what I really love about watercolor. 
I mean, I love the controlled aspect of it. Don't get me wrong. I do love that. But I also love the spontaneousness of it. I'm just really digging this. I hope you are. Okay, so I want a little more in there. If you notice on our plant here, um, the stems are actually kind of like a wine color. So we can add in some, you know what? I kind of want to get a little, um, I don't want any yellow on its own. I wonder if I want to, I think I want a little yellow, yellow ochre or something in there. Let's grab a little yellow ochre or raw sienna. I think this is raw sienna. Either way, either way it'll work. I'm going to add a little bit of that into our stems. That's always nice because you know what? We don't have a pure yellow. We have that yellowy green, but we don't have like a yellow per se. So let's get that in there. And then let's go in with some of that Bordeaux because I also think the Bordeaux color is really good. Would be really good here. And I could mix the Bordeaux with the green if I wanted a brown, which is, which is nice. Okay. I am going to coax those together a little bit with a damp brush. So I'm not really, I'm not doing the open drip in the stems because there's not really enough space to do that there. Oh, I like that ombre we got going on here. That's nice. Okay, so now for these, um, the top of this little guy, this is very brown. So let's mix up a brown. Let's take that Bordeaux. Let's take a little of the um, darker green there. Uh, let's use a little bit of this lighter sap green color. Oh, that's nice. There we go. We've got a nice earthy, olivey brown. And let's add some of that right up here. And we can stipple it in because you do have that kind of texture of the stippling in there. It's not really a lot of color. It's just more like this brown dottiness on the uh, stem there. And I think I'll use some of that in the center here. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. So now let's see what's dry. Oh, that feels dry to me. So I'm going to go up and work on those petals. I'm kind of concerned about that not being completely dry. So I'm going to work on this one back here first because I'm okay with like the ink spilling into the leaves. I think that looks kind of cool. Ink spilling into the pink flower petal probably wouldn't look as great. So let's go back here. Let's wet this one. Depending on the paper that you have, you'll get a different effect with the open drip technique. If you're on a cellulose paper that's heavily sized, you're going to get a lot more like cauliflowers. If you're on a cotton paper like this, the cotton absorbs more water so you don't get so much standing on the surface. And um, it's almost like a sponge or fabric. You get, It disperses the paint a little bit more. Um, I'm definitely going to get a cauliflower here with how much ink, uh, paint I have puddling. But for the most part, it'll give you a softer blend. So if you're having that issue, if you're having streakiness um, with your paintings and it's not what you want, try going with a cotton paper. I think you'll have a lot more... Um, a lot more success with that. It is more expensive, but there are inexpensive cotton papers like the Aqua Bee um, that you can find on... Amazon or or any like I like I just ordered a huge pack of the really big sheets from NASCO which is a school supplier but that's a really affordable paper and I don't you know I it's it's a really wonderful quality too so it's not just affordable but it's a good quality and that's if you're not if you're not happy with what's going on don't change anything if you like if you like what you have okay uh, a little bored out with that that blue on its own is a little strong Of course, by tipping my paper so much, I might be ruining the cauliflower effect. We'll see. We'll see when it's done, what we end up with. Uh, and I can crisp up this edge a little bit, but I don't want to ruin, I don't want to lose, like, I don't want to mess with that too much because I like the effect that I've got going. Like, this isn't going to be one of those paintings where we have a lot of glazes. This is going to be more of a direct type of painting. And let's do those two little areas. Since it's not very big, you know what I think? I'll just put some of this color right here. And then just wet the rest of the area and let them whip together. Open drip, you really need a little bit more space. Not very much water there because it's such a small space. You don't want it to 
have a big puddle. Okay, we can go start working on those other petals. I think that's pretty dry. I try to touch on the back of my hand or the meaty palm, meaty part of my thumb there, uh, because then I can really tell if it's cool or room temperature. If it's room temperature, it's dry. If it's cool, it's still a little damp. And if you paint once a little damp, you're going to have a feathered edge where the um, where the new paint touches the old paint. And a lot of times that's not what you want. Now I got a little of that paint on this petal by mistake so I can scrub it a little bit and lift it. And I mean, this is just a soft brush, so it's really no pressure. I'm just brushing over it. Uh, this is a fairly well-sized cotton paper, so it will it will allow some lifting. Some cotton papers, like I noticed like Fabriano Artist Artistico, don't allow as much lifting. I think that has to do with the type of sizing that's in it as well. I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but I would say this is probably a gelatin sized paper because of how easily it lifts. But I could be wrong. They could have, you know, you know, uh, more robust synthetic sizing these days. Okay, now I think I can actually get in here and do those two petals as well because I think there's enough gap of my ink line there to separate it and I think that it's not even touching this petal, so I think I'm good. And even if it, those two bleed together, it's not really that big of an area, so I'm not really that concerned. This time I'm gonna go in with the Bordeaux first. I hope this is interesting. Gosh, it feels like sometimes I'm concerned when I put a really long tutorial that people are gonna be, are gonna be not interested. I like to have something a little bit darker back here just for the just for the depth to give you a little bit of a difference in depth. I think I just leave it like that. I don't think I really need the pink in there, especially since I'm going to put gold in the background. Um, okay, there's not really much I can do at this point because I need to let stuff dry. So I'm going to let things dry and we'll come back and we will finish that last petal and uh, that last leaf and then we'll work on the gold. I used my heat tool to dry this, and one thing you want to think about or remember if you're using a hair dryer or a heat tool to dry this is to let your paper cool off before you do the back of the hand test to make sure that the paper's not just warm from heating it, that, you've actually, um, that it actually is dry. I got a larger eraser here. I'm really curious to test the... Um, Oh yeah, it is working. I wanted to really test that um, the technique about using the eraser on top of using the colored pencil to see if it would really remove that pigment, and it does. It works really well. So um, that poinsettia that I did on Sketchbook Sunday, where I didn't have the resist that I wanted, so I painted around. I could have just used an eraser, and that would have that would have solved my problem. So um, so that's kind of really neat neat to uh, to learn. Here you can see. This is the one that I sketched with you on video. You can see those lines emerge. Just gotta make sure that that uh, paint is dry so you don't end up smudging it. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I'm really pleased about that. All right, now that I know that works, I will definitely use that technique more. And uh, how fun is that? Oh, that's really cool. So, yay. Oh, something else I want to tell you about colored pencils. When they get short, um, if you use an extender, you can get a lot, you can use up right down to the last bit. And these are not pricey. They're like th a pack of three for $3 on Amazon with free shipping. It takes a while for them to get here, but um, but they're great. And I'll link those below if you're curious about them. But I just have a three pack and I just switch them around if I need to, but I always have nubby little white ones. And I hate to waste them because if you get a good white colored pencil that doesn't break on you, you want to use every last bit. Um, yeah, that's Prismacolor problems, but <laughs> I just love Prismacolor so much that I put up with it. Uh, and the whites do tend to be the ones that want to break the most because they're such a soft, opaque um, pencil. So that just keeps me keeps me from wasting them. All right, so this one here is in back of those two, so I want the color to be a little bit deeper, especially at the edges where they meet. So I will actually do the green with a little bit of that phthalo blue, Prussian blue, phthalo blue, into throne blue whatever deep cool blue you have whatever you used for your for your if you've used it already on another section of this painting use that blue okay don't uh don't skip around if you can help it i mean if you forget and you grab the wrong one you know that's that's you know not a big deal but 
I would try to use as few colors as you need to get the job done so you end up with a really harmonious painting. Oh, I feel like I didn't, did I not about that? I feel like it's, paint's barely moving there. I don't think I wet it enough. Maybe I didn't wet it at all. I'll have to review the footage. Need an instant replay. <laughs> I'll do a little of this brighter color down near the edge that's leaping out of the box, which I really, I like stuff like that. I think it's kind of fun and quirky. Um, do any, leave some of that white showing if you want to. I think that's pretty too. And you'll notice like in your paint, certain colors are going to flow more than others. And it's just interesting to kind of keep aware of that so that you can um, use it to your advantage. Now, something I wanted to mention, because I mentioned blooms, and we've got a couple here. This one right here is really strong because I had a really strong puddle there. So you see that ruffled edge that when I say a cauliflower or a bloom, that's what I'm referring to. We have a little bit of one here where you get kind of these fingery like um, lighter areas, which I think is just a really pretty texture. And then right there is a pretty strong example of it. Uh, and I, it just, it, sometimes you can force it by having puddles, basically. And you can also force it if you have a wash that is damp and you flick water into it, that will give you that same effect on purpose. So, um, so now you know. Now you know how to do it if you didn't know before. So hopefully this black, is, oh good, it's black. Well, it's not completely set, so you know what I might do? I might splatter it all in the background because I, uh, having an issue there. Uh, that was just way too thick and I must have only dried the top layer. Goodness gracious. Okay, so let's try to scrub out some of that, blot it, and then dry it to make sure whatever is left is going to stay put. I don't want to have a muddy gray under my petals, so that's what I'm trying to remove. I don't want to scrub too much because I don't want to damage the sizing. Actually, you know what? I think that I'm just going to go in with the paint. If some of that leaches over, I'm not going to worry about it. That's what I think. Life's too short to worry about that, especially since I've already got ink dribbled everywhere else. That's, uh, I'm not even going to worry about it. That's interesting, though. I'm surprised at that that, because I waited, because I was afraid that was going to happen, so I waited to the end to do that, and there was still enough wet ink underneath the dried surface that it activated when I got the when I went over it with the water. Well, that's a good lesson. That's a good teachable moment. I'll throw that in there now. Do I want I think I do want to have a little bit of that um thalo blue and bordeaux mix down here at the bottom. I just like to trace sometimes the, the opening of the flower there. And then I just want a hint of color on the inside. I've already put a little of that brown mix in there, so I don't want to re I don't want to totally wet everything. I'm just going to gently go over with a damp brush and spread some of that color in there. And I think that's I think that's plenty. Um, don't want that completely white up there, so I am going to just help it a little bit. And I'm just lifting out a little highlight just by going in with a with a damp clean brush and see you can just lift out a little highlight it just gives it a little dimension and so the petal feeling so flat it kind of pulls it out from the others and I think that looks nice okay so now I, I do want to get in with the gold um that petal that is still wet so there are certain there are areas I can put the gold in like I can do this quadrant this quadrant I can do there I would just need to leave these areas for last and the gold ink I'm using now this is optional guys do whatever you want to do with your painting um but to keep things fresh for me I like to try new things so I'm using it's not even new I've had this bottle of ink for probably 10 years um, this is Winsor & Newton Gold Ink. It actually had dried up on me at one point and I added some water and stirred it up and left it alone and it, and it came back to life. So that was, I was really pleased with that. I'm going to use an acrylic, a brush that I would use for acrylics. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little picky with my watercolor brushes. I'm, I baby them because they do tend to be expensive. A wall, I don't know if they're more expensive. I tend to spend more on a watercolor brush than I'm willing to spend on another media brush. Um, so I do tend to baby them, but, uh, you know, so you probably would be all right because this is a, you know, it is, it is an ink that you can re reconstitute, but it's definitely a more, 
it's a it's a more robust maybe is the word it's just a little bit more permanent than watercolor I'm just afraid that if I didn't do a good job cleaning it that I might damage my brush my watercolor brush so I want to keep that keep my watercolor brush is just watercolor. Now watercolor is not going to harm any of your other brushes so if you had acrylic brushes already and you didn't want to buy watercolor brushes you are not going to hurt your acrylic um, your acrylic paint brushes by using them with watercolor. However you can destroy your watercolor brushes using them with acrylics. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure if I like this brush very much for this because I seem to be getting ridges because this ink is a little thicker. It's actually quite a bit thicker than watercolor. I'm going to switch to a different brush. The, the nice thing about this is it doesn't want to be streaky, so I think I could actually use a round brush, and I was worried that if I used a round, it would be a little streaky. But I think I'm going to be all right, actually. As soon as I find one to use. Here we go. Just a golden tackle on round. I think this came in a smart art box. You'll have to re-dip more often, or at least get a little puddle there that you can work from. And this might, you know, I might decide, look how opaque that is. So if you do have any rough edges, you can fix them. Um, I might decide that I want things to be a little bit more vivid after I get this gold in. It'll be really interesting. And the thing I notice, though, when I do gold or any sort of metallics, or if I use like a metallic watercolor, um... If I'm going to put this in a frame, it does kind of lose the gold effect. So this might be one of those techniques that's best for like your art journal or your sketchbook where um, where it can be held and there's nothing between the viewer and the artwork. And you can tip it to the light and you can get that interesting effect. But then again, it might be so pretty you want to frame it. It might be better to, I don't know, I don't know what I would do. Would I float it maybe in a floater frame? That's kind of neat. I think it'll have to dry before we get the full gold effect. I'm just looking for ridges right now actually. And I think if I do have some ridges, I will just flatten them out with a flat brush. Because I'm afraid that if I have ridges, if I brush something over this, like if I just brush my hand over it or whatever, I think it might rub off. I don't know how much adhesion the ink has if I don't have it in a thin layer. I'm not very familiar with ink. I've had this ink forever, I'm ashamed to say, um, and I haven't really used it that much. It's a tiny bottle of ink. I'm pretty sure it came in my Christmas stocking one year. All right, this is probably not the most entertaining thing to watch, so I think I will um, come back after I've got the gold filled in. It occurred to me as I was doing this that I could correct this guy here. It's a little too big at the bottom with, because this ink is so opaque. So yay, that's kind of neat. So that might be something that you might want to file away in your brain for if you're doing a a, uh, you're doing some sort of artwork and you've got stuff in the background that you didn't like. Um, maybe you made an error in your drawing and it was in the ink. Um, you can really carve back to, um, you know, you can really carve something back into where it needs to be with this technique. So that's kind of neat. Um, I'm really pleased with that. Now, when I'm getting ridges, what I'm doing is going back over them and smoothing them out, either with a flat brush or even just with a round after I've used up um, the ink that's on it so that I'm not depositing more. So don't worry about making it completely flat. As you go, you can go back in and you can touch it up. I might even go back in with um, with the black ink again and you know darken up some of my lines because I do notice when I'm going up near things with this gold ink, I end up obliterating some of my lines, and some of the lines I want, you know, I want to keep. So there's just something to to consider. And see, I'm just going through with this this little flat angle here, and uh, I'm just trying not to lay my hand in any wet ink. But I can go and I can kind of lift off the the like any ridges that I have. Maybe I need to dilute my ink more. It does say on the bottle you can thin it with distilled water. So, you know, it could be, it could have a little thick. I did stop and shake the bottle 
because I thought that the ink was separating a little bit. Uh, and that might be because I had reconstituted it from, you know, sludge, basically, because I had gone so long without using it. Ooh, I like that. Um, so where, as it dries, it does even out a little bit here. I went over that ink, the black ink spot, and you can kind of see where it's raised, where it was there, but I mean, it does even out really well. So something I'm kind of curious about was how this would look if we had some kind of watered down, um, if we watered it down a little bit. And I thought it'd also be kind of cool to add to the kind of craziness in the background. So I thought I would do, I would just flick on some water. I think I'll use that, this bigger brush here and then drip some of the, the ink in there and see what happens. So let's um, let's use that paintbrush I was using for the ink because I don't, like I mentioned before, I don't trust myself to use my watercolor brushes because I'm kind of, kind of not that great with it. And there's flicking it on. Flicking it on, it definitely doesn't want to spread so much. Oh, I don't know if it's going to really move with the, um, with the water that much because it's so heavy. Let's see. It's pretty as it's like kind of kind of flowing around in there. You see the glimmers in there. It's it's pretty. Hmm, I'm not sure what I think about that. I think I want to try it some more though. Let's go in with a bigger brush so I can get some bigger spatters in the background here. I just don't want to mess up uh I'm being very deliberate not to not to get this into that that area there, but I think I also want to have some of that magenta color in there. So let's grab some of that. You don't have to do this, you know, I just to I mean I know you probably realize that, but you do not have to do anything on your painting that you don't like. I hope you realize that. No matter who's teaching it, you can do whatever you want in your painting. I misplaced my little spray bottle. That's kind of a bummer because I love to just give a little spritz of of water. That really helps. Hmm. I do not know what I did with that. I think I I think I took it to class and I left it in my class bag. So I'm just gonna have to improvise. That's all right too. Okay, so now I want to see what happens if I put a little bit of that uh, that gold in there. I'm just taking it out of the lid and mixing it in with some water with the brush that I used to apply it. I don't think that's that exciting actually, now that I see that. I think that, I don't know, we'll see how it dries, but that's not as exciting as I thought it was going to be. But I do like having that color in the background. Although I feel like I want it a little bit more smushy. So much for having that white background, right? <laughs> That's okay though, I don't mind. Oh, oh, you know what? I think I would like some raw sienna back there. Oh, I love that color. Isn't that pretty? Now the raw sienna from Renaissance, I believe is the same pigment as the yellow ochre PY42. Sometimes your raw sienna is a PBR7. It's a little more transparent when it's that way. I have totally gone off the rails with the background, but I don't, I don't mind. I like it. That's the only thing that about half pans is when I want to use a brush like this, it's really difficult to get it in those half pans. That's why I prefer having a larger studio palette. But then if I have a larger studio palette, I can't have all this other stuff out of my desk that I want to have. It's so, it's so frustrating because, you know, there's, there's benefits to every method, every way of working, but you can't have all the benefits at once, you know. Even if you have a huge table, you won't be able to reach everything. I like that though. I love it when the colors kind of merge together. I like kind of the tightness of the gold versus the looseness of the watercolor. I wish I had my spray bottle though, I'm not going to lie. That would be totally epic. So with my spray bottle then I could then I could be spritzing this as I went. I'm kind of thinking I want a little more of that blue up here, I like that blue a lot. But I think this brush is too big. Here's something you can do, if you have a um, 
If you have a brush that you want to include in a travel kit, but it's too long, you can chop it off. And you can make it fit your fit your container. Now this, the neat thing about this brush here, actually, and I did a video on it, if you want to find it, it's on my channel. I bought these double-ended brushes from Jerry's a couple of years ago, and um, I cut them in half because they had like a small round on one and a big round on the other, or maybe it was a flat on, on one end and a round on the other, and I chopped them up, and that worked really well for travel brushes. Double-ended brushes, I'm like, how are you supposed to use those? Because if you... If you put them in a cup to store them, one end is going to get smushed. But actually, I bought them with the intent of cutting them into travel brushes, so it really wasn't a dilemma. That's probably why they were such a good price, because people were like, what the heck are you supposed to do with these? I know, I said. Give me that bargain. Give me that bargain. I know just what to do. Mwahaha. And, you know, seriously, you could play with this all day. It's so much fun. I honestly think if you've got, like, a material that you're, you don't know what to do with, or you're like, oh, I'm bummed, I don't want to spend a lot of time on something because I might rip this paper taking it out, or whatever it is, it's something you don't like about a product. I think that's the best time to grab that product and experiment because you, you kind of already feel like you have nothing to lose. And when you feel like you have nothing to lose, that's when you, that artistic freedom comes out. Uh, so now I'm just going to look at this and figure out if I want to do anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. I haven't um, erased in there yet. Uh, I, oh, I want to watch this area right there. I'm going to have a weird hard edge. So what I want to do is diffuse that and take out dry brush, like a clean, damp brush, and just kind of fade that bit off. Um, I think I might want to add a little bit of veining on some of those. I'm going to grab a skinnier brush for that, though. This is just one of those projects that you could spend so much time playing with. It's got a little Mimic Kalinske here. Not a real Kalinske. It's made from synthetics. And just be careful if you're going to go in here and do any of this stuff because, um... You, do, you have so much wet background right now. You could let it dry. There's nothing wrong with that. Let it dry. I'm adding a little bit of color in there. I don't want to do credit card scraper with this. Um, I thought that might be a little bit too much with the wax. So, you know, I will sometimes limit the techniques that I use because I just think it'll be a little bit too, uh, too much. I'm debating whether I want to do anything on that because um, I like seeing the veins. I think I will, especially since I did get some gray going on here with the uh, with that ink. And also, if you switch to a smaller brush towards the end, really, there's you're not going to do a huge amount of damage, even if you make a mistake or you're not happy with it. It's only so much you're gonna only so much paint you're gonna put down with a smaller brush. So I wouldn't let it keep you from experimenting. And glazing on these veins will still let some of that beauty of the open drip technique show through, but it'll give you a little more structure because you got to have a focal point. You got to have something that's a little bit more detailed, and all these other elements you've put in are going to kind of enhance it and um, you know support it. But you got to have something that is your focal point. So at this point, I'm going to let this dry, and I'm actually going to take a little break and come back and look at it and see what it needs, and that's when we shall meet again. Okay, I let this dry, and I've just been kind of thinking about what I want to do. Do I want to add some stamping or stenciling or something? I'm not quite sure still, but I did want to make some of the lines a little bit more pronounced and thicker, and I thought I would use this um, waterproof pen. Uh, it's a brush tip pen. It's the um, it's uh, the License to Quill pen. You can get it at Michael's. It's, um, it's about $10 or so. Uh, I'd use a coupon, you know, get it for half. Um, and I just, I figured I would try this because that way I can have some thin and thick lines depending on how hard I want to press. You just need a really light touch though. I'm hoping that I'm not going to be too shaky and I can do this without adding, um, 
adding dark lines where I don't want it. But I had, with the gold, I was able to correct some edges, which was really nice. But the downside was that I kind of lost some uh, some lines that I wanted. So I think I'm just going to go through in some areas and just give it a little bit of definition. I hope that's in frame. I'm moving it around so it's comfortable while I hold it, especially where I'm going off the edge and out of the boundaries. I think that would look kind of neat if I had a little bit stronger edge there to kind of bring it forward. Then again, I might regret it. Who knows? <laughs> you never know. That's that's the thing. That's the beauty of it. The beauty of it? <laughs> that's the beauty of ruining your artwork. You never know what's going to happen. But I figured with this waterproof pen, and really, I mean, if you if you know you're not going to go over it with anything else, you can use whatever you want. But I thought, if I have the waterproof pen and I do decide that I want to go in and do some more to it, then... That'll be fine because I'm not gonna, it's not gonna bleed. Because one thing I feel like with a dip pen, you don't have that, that response of a, like a brush tip. And so if you're used to using a brush and not very used to using a pen, it can get a little, um, you know, it can be a little stiff and unwieldy. Oh, I kind of like that. I think that gives it a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more prominence in some of the areas coming down outside of the frame. I don't know if I want to do the frame. I don't think I do. I think because it's going to be really hard for me to get a really straight line with a pen, I think I will leave that the way it is. And I'm still going to think a little bit more about this because I'm debating whether I want to do maybe a little stamping or stenciling or something in the background. So I'm going to have another think before I call this done. Okay, I really feel like I need to apologize for going off the rails so far on this. This was supposed to be a beginner watercolor Wednesday painting, but I'm sorry. It's just kind of gone a little a little off the rails. Um, I do want to add some stamping and stenciling in the background. I really, you know, it brings me joy to go through my stash and pull out these supplies I haven't used in a while. What I did was I put a post-it note down over my paper, traced around it, and cut it out. Okay, I can show you how I did that over here since I'll want to do it again. All I'm going to do is trace this shape and then I will cut it out. So you just need to get that that shape there and that's going to protect it so that when you stamp you can um, you can stamp right over that area and it will be kind of protected. And you don't have to be perfect, just kind of get a, a rough shape there because your stamping is probably not going to be perfect on a rough watercolor paper. This is actually a really fun way to create just kind of going on the fly like this because you are able to kind of see what a painting needs and then can add to it intuitively which I really love when I'm painting. Um, so I hope you give something like this a try. So what I thought I would use is some old stamps. I have just like a text stamp, like a French script type stamp. I've got a swirl and I've just got like this little um, field notes thing. I thought it would be kind of fun. And I'm going to use archival ink. Really, if you're not going to watercolor over on top of it, you can use anything you want. And I would recommend if you have them, the clear stamps for this, just because they are a little more squishable than rubber. So they're going to be able to handle the texture on your watercolor paper a little bit better. Um, if you have a rubber stamp that's like nice and bold, that should work pretty well too. And I'm just going to, and I'm really going to press that well because I want to make sure it's making contact on a rough watercolor paper or a cold pressed watercolor paper that's got that texture. You know, it's just going to take a little extra to get it to push down there. Ooh, that's pretty. I like that. See, and then it looks like that design is kind of coming out from behind. And I think the black from that really helps, um, really kind of helps what we have going on with this, um, you know, with the ink that we put on there. So I'm also going to do that, do a little bit of that swirl over here, but I do want to protect a little bit more because it is of such a big stamp. You can also just lay a piece of paper over your um, over your area. The nice thing about the post-it notes is that you have um, it kind of sticks down because it's got the it's got the adhesive on the back, but it's not enough sticky to pull up your ink or your um, your paint or anything. So 
it should be pretty good. I think I think that's going to be enough to cover what we need to cover there. And we'll ink that back up again. The reason I like archival ink is because um, if you do stamp something, you can watercolor over it and it's not going to run. And I find that it's um, it stays wet enough on your stamp that you get a good impression on watercolor paper. My post-it notes could be a teeny bit stickier, actually. And just make sure you give it a really good press, because you want that to get in the grooves of your watercolor paper. Oh, I like that. There, I think that just gives it a really nice effect. Now the next thing I want to do is, um, I've got the stamp that says Field Notes on it. Now these stamps are from, um, these are from Tattered Angels. I don't even know if that company's still around. I've had these for quite a long time, but I'm sure you can find something if you don't, you know, this is going to be really hard to find. So if you don't have this from back in the day, I'm sure you can find something that is comparable. Now I've got this on a big piece of plexiglass, so I'm going to wipe off all this extra ink because I don't want to transfer that by mistake. Not that, I mean, we have a lot going on in the background, so it probably would be fine, but I really would rather not have to deal with any more trouble than I've already got from my splashes and ink splots and everything. And then another thing that I like to do sometimes is do a little stenciling. And the benefit of stenciling is that you can add these little bits of pattern here and there, um, and you can do it very, very deliberately, and you can really choose where you're going to put these um, these items. And something I like to use a lot when I'm stenciling are like these little, um, they're kind of like a water-soluble oil pastel, they're very creamy, almost like a lipstick, and they work really well for this. So I have a gold, I wanted to do metallic colors, so I have a um, kind of like a gold, a pink, metallic-y pink color, um, a purple, and a green. I'm just kind of scribbling them down and I think the purple will go well because it's, you know, I got that color in some of the areas. This stencil's by Hero Arts. It is, this one is um, recent, so you can find that in like a craft store if you want to. I'll try to link stuff up down below if I can find it. I'm not sure about this red. Let me just... Yeah, that red's a little... That's a little too coral. So let me grab a pink here. Um, there's so many products that are very similar to one another, and like these these Jane Davenport color sticks are very similar to those water soluble oil pastels. These don't happen to be creamy, I mean uh, metallic, but the color is right, so I think that will be good. And when I'm working with products, I try to keep them all out while I'm working with them so I don't get confused and grab the wrong thing. That one doesn't look, that one looks too coral to me. I'm gonna grab one that's a little bit more fuchsia. Oh yeah, I like that. And I can mix that with some of the more metallic colors and get that um, kind of get a little sparkle in there. And then I am going to use just a little. Uh, actually, this is a Jane Davenport blender, but I'm going to use that because I can smudge that stuff around really well. Actually, my finger might work a little bit better on that. You know what? I think my finger's going to work better. And these are water soluble, so if you find you're not, they're not moving, you can take a wet sponge, like a wet makeup sponge, and that will help. Now, plus you can wipe off some of the stuff that gets on your stencil and then it doesn't go to waste. Now, after doing purple, I could go on to the pink because those colors are similar enough. I think I do want to add a little bit of water. See, that does help it blend a little bit. And you can blend it more if you don't want to see the texture of the paper. You can blend it less if you do. This stencil is really slick, actually. It wants to slide around with me. I usually don't have that much trouble with stencils. I guess I should have taped it down. You just want to be careful when you do tape down to your watercolor paper that you don't um, that you don't damage it. So just be careful when you remove it, I should say. You don't want to have it too wet either because if it is, it's going to seep underneath the stencil and that's not good. I just want a very, very subtle patterning. 
in the background. Something like that. That's a little, oh, I didn't get all the gold. Let's get that right there. Okay, now if you don't like it, you can always, um, you can always alter it a little bit. You could brush some water over it. You could splatter some paint over it. You're not limited. You know, you don't have to stick with it. If you don't like it, you can change it. And I always think that if it's to the point where I, you made a mistake and you're not sure if you're going to like it, what's worse that can happen if you, um, if you paint over it or if you brush something over it? I mean... When you're when you're at the stage where you're doing mixed media, I think that you're like in, in a painting, you've decided to add the mixed media to it, then you've gotten a lot more freedom because anything goes at that point. You can you can add more, you can um, scrape stuff back, you can add dimensional things, you don't have to keep it flat. And I think that's a that's a lot of freedom. And sometimes, you know, you just come into your, your studio or maybe it's your kitchen table and you just wanna play, and that's that's what I was feeling today. I'm still kind of feeling vacation because my um, one of my kids went back to school today. The other two are still off until next Monday, so it still feels a little bit like vacation to me. Oh, you know what? I really like that wetting it more, and it kind of mushes out a little bit. So maybe I want to do something like that. Um, see if I can line that stencil back up again and maybe mush these out a little bit because I liked that a little bit more. It just looked a little bit more organic and natural to me. So this is a very firm sponge. So if you are, I don't really know much about makeup sponges. The ones I usually get that are like the little makeup wedges, they are way softer than this. So I don't know if you can buy these different firms, like as this is a Jane Davenport one meant for art. But um, you could probably, if you had a little bit firmer of a sponge, I think that would work. Ooh, I'm going to go ahead and make myself a little frame. I really hope now that, because remember I did, I started this whole box thing because I was like, oh, I'm afraid that I'm going to rip my paper when I, uh, oh, my plant out of the way, when I take this off the thing. So I'm going to make sure I don't have anything I want near the edge, right? That's how this whole thing started. That's how I decided, well, I'm just going to do a little bit of ink. I'm not really going to do a bunch of mixed media. I'm just gonna, you know, a little bit of ink. Everyone's got a little ink. They can find a pen. And it turns into this because it always snowballs. <laughs> it always snowballs. It's like, innocently enough, I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna use a little bit of mixed media. And, you know, people don't have to add mixed media if they don't want to, which is totally true. But now it's turned into some crazy big ordeal. It's got all this mixed media in it. <laughs> but again, you do not have to you don't have to do the mixed media if you don't have the supplies or you don't want to. Um, or you can, you know, find some other substitutions. You could use chalk pastels. You could use whatever whatever works for you, really. Oh, I like that, though. I like it. Sometimes you don't know you're going to like it until you start messing with it, and then you realize, yeah, this is what I meant to do all along. And something I was also thinking about, um, but, you know, because I actually had to take a little bit of a little, little break. The kids had some friends over, and I was kind of enjoying their their chitter chatter in the other room and drinking my cup of tea trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do next. Um, I was kind of thinking it would be kind of cool to grab some colored pencils, especially that white that's floating around here that looks strangely blue when I have it on watercolor paper and kind of add a little bit of like dimension give this almost like a three-dimensional feel so it like kind of pops out of the pops out of the picture a little bit and I can also go in here if I want to make the uh, our like pattern on here a little bit more strong I can do that too I'm kind of like in this I, I'm just really excited with what's happening here so when that happens I tend to want to move fast and like get really scribbly with it. Oh, we never erased that part. Let's see if we can get some of that veining to show up. Yes, we can. Because remember we did the colored pencil. Could you remember that like three and a half hours ago when we were doing that? And we and we, we originally started by sketching on with a colored pencil. Got a little bit more of that in there. 
Now uh, let's see what we have for pinks. I like to keep my um, this is the this is a tip. I keep my pencils, my colored pencils, uh, my Prisma colors right next to my my work desk upstairs because I tend to really use them a lot when they're open, when they're out in the open. Um, I just flipped an old spice rack on its side and I put them in those little containers there. And it is wonderful because I actually use them. When they were in their tin, I never used them. And it was such a shame because I enjoy them so much. And they're so impactful on watercolor paper because of the texture of the paper. It just really grabs the pencil. And then you've got these beautiful, you can get some beautiful opacity. You can, you know, if you've kind of lost some detail or you've lost some oomph, you can bring that oomph back just by going in with a, with a colored pencil. And I do love to do cyclamens with colored pencil. I actually did a little demo of that last year. You can find that it was a Prismacolor review, I think, because I was curious to see if the Prismacolors were any good anymore because so many people were complaining about them, and I found out, spoiler alert, that they're still pretty awesome. The new ones are awesome too. I think they had some bad, they had a, they had a bad, uh, bad time of it when, when they smoothed their factories, and I think it took them a while to get the kinks worked out. That's what I think anyway, and I feel like I want something that's maybe, ooh, this color will work. Nice Pepto-Bismol pink. Love that color. My best friend in high school had a, her bedroom was painted Pepto Bismol pink. I was very envious of that. I had violet wallpaper. There we go. Let's see, where's that wither white go? Hmm. I like this. I don't know if you, I don't know if anybody else is going to like it. Probably most people are going to think this is a hot mess, and I do apologize because I did intend to have just a simple beginner watercolor tutorial today, but um, sometimes you can't plan art. Sometimes the art is just going to come out the way it's going to come out, and you can either fight it and you can force yourself to do something that is not what you're passionate about at that time, or you can go with the flow and see what happens. And um, I'm glad I went with the flow. I hope you guys are. I hope I didn't just like, I hope you're not bummed out because it's not a beginner, um, it's not a beginner watercolor Wednesday-esque picture, but you know what? You don't have to do it. You don't, ha you don't have to do it just like this. You can do it however you like, you know, you can do just watercolor and that's fine. That would be pretty. You know what I should have done? You know what? I think I should do my beginner watercolor Wednesdays on greeting cards because I think I tend to go off the rate. If I am like a goldfish, if I have a big space, I will fill it. And that's what happened here. I had a big space and I filled it. I'm like a little maroon here because really those stems are really quite maroon. If you look at them here, I got my little plant, my little cute plant. The stems are kind of like a maroonish color. So I thought I'd throw a little of that in. It's just evolving. I kind of like that because I think, I think I personally, I don't know about other people, but I like it when my art evolves and it surprises me. It's like, well, that's not what I expected to happen. And I, and I think we should all have, you know, I was a little stressed out about it, honestly, because I was like, oh man, everyone's going to want a beginner thing today. And this is just not coming out as a simple watercolor like I intended. You know, I was kind of bummed out, but I was like, but then again, I don't want to just, I don't want to limit myself. I feel like doing more with this. And I'm like, well, hopefully they understand and hopefully they get something out of it because because I don't, I, to thine own self be true, I don't want to do something that I'm not feeling passionate about. I don't want to resent the artwork that I'm creating. I want to create what I am really feeling into, you know? And I think that's kind of part of the reason why I was getting burnt out with the live streams because I had to always do safe work that I knew how it was going to come out because I was asking people to spend part of their day with me and I couldn't just, you know, edit out the bad bits. I couldn't, I couldn't change it if it was, if it wasn't going well. And, and so it kept me on a very safe, easy to, you know, just predictable path. I guess predictable, predictable for me anyways, it might not have been predictable for other people, but it was very predictable for me. And I wasn't, I wasn't loving it. I was feeling very frustrated and this is fun. I'm enjoying this. I hope other people do <laughs> because otherwise I'm just painting by myself, which is all right. Um, I'm just going around the veins a little bit there to make them pop a little bit because uh, the the the, uh, the leaves are darker 
than how I've rendered them. But I just love those little bits of lime and chartreuse. I just think there's something just really energetic about them. And I am just adding little punches of the dark so I have a little bit more of the truth of the color. But I also want to get my impression of the flower, which is one of my favorite flowers. I wish I could, they're supposed to grow outside, but I think it's too cold. I think they die over the winter in Maine if we have them outside. I think it has to be in warmer areas, but I just really love this plant. I've always loved these flowers and, uh, and I just wanted to, uh, wanted to capture them and the spirit of them. And hopefully I did. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I'll bring this up a little bit closer. You can see that it actually is pretty metallic. I kind of wondered if I had done something to the ink where I had added water to it, where it was really just sludge at one point because it had dried out. Um, so I'm wondering if it's not as metallic as it should be, but it's kind of metallic. I think it looks pretty nice. Um, I saw somebody use this ink. It might've been in the live show for Glights Facebook group. And it seemed like it was super shiny, and I'm not sure that mine is that shiny, but it definitely is a different texture and reflection from the other um, elements that I used. I'm really happy with it. I hope you enjoyed this. Please give me a thumbs up if you did. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope I didn't bore you. I guess if I did, you're not here still. You would have left long ago. And uh, <laughs> well, next I will do something simple in watercolor for you soon. I am, I am sorry if you were hoping for that today because I totally dropped the ball there. But I think this is pretty cool, so hopefully you do too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.